Welcome back, fellow armchair generals, to this special episode of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice and Third Reich events um, testing. The special episode we are going to be talking about is economies. And we're looking at the economy as it's set up um, with Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice. <clears throat> and if you're adding um, Third Reich events, what are the changes going to be and why I'm doing this? And if you have other sub mods, they and down in the down in the um, list of things added, they may make changes back to what I've done. But this is how I'm doing this, and this is an important test we are looking at now. And I'm not really paying attention to the chat unless you tag me, guys, because I want to talk on this for the moment. But go ahead and chat, um, please do. Okay. Um, first off, I want to say, oh man, I'm getting a little scratchy voice here. I really love Black Ice. I really love a lot of what they do with the game. But there's one, shall we say, I guess, and this goes back for, for a considerable time with Black Ice, one considerable disagreement I have to the, to the core with their design philosophy of Black Ice. And they're putting it on steroids now. And I don't mean to be re disrespectful, but in all honesty, honesty, they are completely wrong in what and how they're doing some things. So um, they can see this as a personal attack. I don't mean it to be one... Um, but it is a, I guess, an attack on their work. I will acknowledge that. So this may be a bit controversial, but okay. What we're looking at is this, is money in this game. <sighs> Business and economies are two different things. To understand one doesn't mean you understand the other. And it's, oh, I forget who originated, but one of the... the the comments is if leftists understood economies they wouldn't be leftists okay this money here and the comment I got from oh my god recently was is many people or people I don't remember exactly what he said but this is a, a, an honest paraphrasing of his comment is many people were um, commenting that money is useless in the game or words to that effect um, and so they're trying to make it more important to the game okay um, I'm just thinking how I should go money um, this is not money money this is not money that you pay people to work. This is not the size of the economy running. This is not the government budget. And that's sort of what they're making it out to be. They even call this in one of the, the things uh, organizing our budget. This is not the government's budget. Okay? Because they're effing I'm going to try not to go too crazy on this thing, but um, having an event, and I've um, made it so it won't happen to pay your soldiers out of this? Soldiers pay? This is not government, m mostly, because we can talk about totalitarian communist governments, but governments mo don't export coal. Companies export coal. Countries export coal. Governments don't. I mean, we can find exceptions or whatever, but governments don't export coal. Companies do. Companies import and export steel, not governments. It comes in and out of a country. This whole thing is, is a somewhat of an abstraction. But this, even though it says money right here, this is not money. Okay? This is um, an international exchange reserve, I think would be a good term 
for it. An international exchange reserve. So, if you say, um, buy oil from Iran, but to pay for it, you sell goods to England. Okay, so, meaning, you're, and they've changed things in some ways not good for Hearts of Iron 4. But, because it's more direct. But let's just say, um, Iran doesn't need Germany's goods. But it wants the money. Because, let's say, it wants to um, buy um, steel. Okay? But Germany doesn't want to sell steel. Because it needs all the steel it can get to build its arms up. Okay? But it has money. But it needs oil. So it sells oil to Iran for this exchange goods or uh, reserve and then to get the, the money it's selling say radios which don't use a lot of steel to Britain okay so it, it's it's so that it doesn't have to be direct you know steel for oil because we don't want to give up our steel but we want to give up some pr produced goods here so this is um, not your soldiers pay not paying domestically for things like tanks aircraft whatever not paying the workers this is not internal economies money and they're making this so yeah and so okay and you know, because one of the things is, it's time to pay our soldiers is one of the things and I was reading some of the code and it's how I found this out because I hadn't played far enough into the game. Thank God. You can pay your soldiers as much as you want. You can pay your soldiers a million dollars a day. What's going to happen is you're going to have inflation. And we're so we're going to talk. And so... And so it doesn't matter what soldiers pay is or the cost of the war none of this matters and we're going to get to some of this in just a moment now the cost of the war let's let's just let's pick a nation um let's go sweden for the moment since it's here there's costs the, the war has costs for sweden let's say one of the costs for sweden is an increased um defense spending by the government building tanks um, having more soldiers paid every day, uh, you know, building rifles, whatever it may be, building bunkers, um, all kinds of stuff. Now, Sweden bought some, and there's an event for it, uh, some naval patrol craft during the, during the war, 1940, I think it was, uh, from Germany you know 20 aircraft something like that okay that it needed its international exchange reserve currency thing here for but for um anything in domestic it doesn't and it can spend whatever it wants to spend on it and so i'm picking sweden is because there is um otherwise very very little cost in the war for sweden Meaning their cities weren't being bombed, their their um, the lives of their people weren't massively disrupted by. Um, I mean, they're it's being disrupted by the war, yes, but not by soldiers going overseas. Yeah, there were a few volunteers or whatever, but Swedish soldiers weren't going off and dying. So, but they're still caught because. But they, I know they did. I don't know how much. I don't have the details on it. It's been years since I read a book about the neutral countries in Europe, which included Sweden, um, Switzerland, Turkey, you know, um, Spain, you know, Port Portugal, the neutral countries in Europe and during the war covered that. And it's been, you know, just a few chapters on each country, but um, it's been years. But, you know, I don't know the, the exact costs or any details on Sweden, but it was not a major participant in the war, but it still had a cost. And so the government can, you know, if it can source all of its materials for whatever it's doing internally and pay its soldiers internally, 
it can spend, the government can spend as much money as it wants to because we are no longer on, well, some countries were still on gold standards, but they could still do inflation. And that's the major cost is inflation, is that if you're paying soldiers, you're paying, paying workers, say, to build guns in your factories, eh, you're not probably selling the guns, especially if it's like artillery or tanks, to the citizens. So you're, you're, you have people making good money, presumably, in factories with nothing to spend it on. That is one and a major, not necessarily the, the primary reason, and it varies from country to country, for rationing, to have ration books. The idea is, is okay, um, some, but there's only a few eggs for sale. There's always only a few eggs for sale because there's all there's you know there's never an unlimited amount of eggs you know but let's say there's very few eggs for sale you know meaning um the war is causing problems with egg supply chain and so someone goes i want two eggs well no you can only have one and he goes well i'll give you a million dollars for the second egg well because of rationing goes, no, sir, I use one egg per ration coupon. We don't care how much you're trying to spend on the eggs. Now, of course, there's a black market, but we're not talking about the black market. So no matter how much money you wanted to throw at the egg seller, so long as we're all following, following by the rules, you could only get one egg per egg coupon in the ration book. And so this is one thing, the ration books, you have to realize at least in all the cases that I know of, they didn't, you didn't hand over the ration coupon and get the product. You had to hand over the ration coupon and money to get the product, whatever it may be. Cause like cloth was rationed. You could still get cloth and there's things about how to cut women's clothes to use less cloth during the war and that kind of thing. It changed fashions. Um, so you could get your product with money and the ration coupon. This is to keep people from, you know, you could always, you know, the million dollars is obviously a hyperbolic statement, but you've got women say that we're on a, um, because of uh, a situation of normally getting married, needing to pay for raising of children, the husband working and making the, the primary external economy money coming in, and the wife much more so than today, back in the 30s and 40s, doing a lot more physical labor, keeping the household going, time, not just physical work, but time consumption. So she only has a limited budget to, say, buy cloth to make clothes for herself. Yes, much of the clothing back in this time period was made at home, not bought in stores. And so... Now you change the wars coming along, whether it's the husband, the boyfriend, or people aren't in a, in a paired couple. Um, he's making money being a soldier, and she's now maybe, she's working. Could be in an arms factory, could be one of the land girls, could be whatever, but she's now having pocket money of her own, or more than pocket money. And so she wants to buy things for herself. So that just even just these are we're not talking rich people. We're talking working people. They have money in their pockets to burn. Well, one of the ways to keep inflation down was ration books. So you can't spend too much. Another one, as we see a lot, are um, war bonds to pay for the war. Now, they make it seem, in the propaganda, and I know, know it mostly from the U.S., they make it seem that they need to, um, and there are some war bond events long time in Black Ice, and I presume there's more here. Um, they make it seem like they need the people to have, spend the war bonds to be able to afford the war. They don't. That's one of the big lies. It does sort of kind of help. But what it really helps is because, you know, because you can deficit spend without people buying your bonds, government bonds. But what it really helps 
is that it takes that money that people are making out of the economy. Now, they give you interest back on it to sort of part of it, because see that it, we're going to get to some of the costs here, is um, is to to encourage you to put your money in it. So you go, hey, yeah, we'll we'll get a, you know, 5% interest back on it. Um, so, you know, you put in $100, you'll get $105 out um, three years from now. So you'll, or per year, or whatever. I don't know if they're compounded. I don't know all the, the war bond stuff. But you put it in. It's a patriotic duty. You put it in. So it takes this money back out of the economy. You're going to get the money back. Now, the key is, and why it's it's good, is you'll get the money back once we've converted to a civilian economy again, not while we're at war. So when you're back and the tank manufacturer, the army truck manufacturer, is now building automobiles, you can run out and buy a new automobile because they'll actually be there for sale. Or if you're a farmer, you can buy a Jeep, you know, a surplus Jeep, um, or something like that to use on your farm. So you will be able to, to spend this money someday. You're pulling this out. Now... As part of the education, we're going to alt tap out, though you're going to still see the, the screen here. Along this time, starting in the 30s, John Maynard Keynes, uh, Keys, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes is an economic theorist, and he comes out. And he, um, up until basically the 1980s, is sort of the dominant um, governments love, government people love his. Um, his economic philosophy, and he was a liberal, uh, as in the Liberal Party of Britain. Um, this is before they went insane. And uh, I want to read, let's see if we can just find a little blurb about Keynesian. Um, is, um, how do they explain it? Uh, Keynesian economics here. I just I pulled up his Wikipedia page. Do they um uh, personal life publications references? Hmm. I was hoping for a little bit of blurb about Keynesian economics. Um, Great Depression. I have a nice chart here. Okay, well, yeah, I'm not going to go into this too much. Um, you can look up Keynesian, and it's basically what, it's government deficit spending, and it's often they talk about priming the pump of, um, of the economics with with. Keynesian economics and let's let me sort of describe what's going on because we're this is important because this is hap excuse me, happening today right now in America particularly and maybe in some of your other countries basically most adult Americans are getting um, $1,200 from the government if you make enough it's you don't get it or other things there's there's some stuff but this isn't just this is not an unemployment check this is a um, stimulus check. This is everybody getting $1,200 to spend however they wish. Well, let's just take it, something that probably most of you know is Steam. If Steam were to um, give everybody a one-time $500 um, check, if you will, into your Steam account, and they went to the major game manufacturers. Let's just say that something like Fortnite or Animal Crossing or something just was not on Steam and it was like a free-to-play game and everybody was playing this one game. And sales on Steam for everything else is down like 80%. So Steam goes, well, how do we get people to buy stuff on Steam again? Well, let's give everybody, say, a $5 credit. You can put to anything they want on Steam. And they go to at least the major game manufacturers and go, hey, you know, can we knock off some percent of the sales from your games? Uh, because you're all down, you're hurting, you know, because obviously there's games that are like, you know, um, 
just a dollar or two on Steam. So they've got to pay these companies out something. So there's actually going to be an outlay of some money to some people. But a lot of the major companies go, oh, yeah, okay, we'll give you some sort of, you know, an internal hidden sale kind of thing on, on the um, things that we sell. And so everybody goes, well, hey, oh, this, this whatever, you know, Call of Duty 28 or Call of Duty whatever, um, Battlefield whatever, or some, some other game on Steam. And you go, oh, well, with this $5 credit, let me go and spend it. Oh, and you had to spend it, say, within 30 days or something like this. This is not a, you know, you get to save it up forever. Because everybody knows eventually whatever game it is is no longer going to be the new hip-hop thing, you know, that, that everybody's out there got to play. They're going to get tired of it and want to go on anything else. But they want to save companies now. So... Um, you have 30 days to spend it. So you go, oh, well, let me go spend this five bucks, you know, and you're there hoping you're going to buy a 20, uh, uh, a 30, a $50 game with, you know, with the five bucks because you, you got to do it and then buy that game, whether you start playing it now or not, but it's to prime the pump into something else. So that has very little cost for Steam, but if they were to give, give out a $40 credit, that would probably bankrupt Steam because they're not their own government. Because they do have outlays. They just can't truly print the money. And, or, if you're giving out $5 a month or $5 several times, people will start to come to expect it. So there will be lots of costs, more than just the $5, if you put, if you do this a lot. So Keynesian economics, in the short run, works. I'm not saying it's good, or I'm not saying it's the, the economy you should have. There's been a lot of pushback. I know there's, I know there's a bit of a resurgence in Keynesian now, generally speaking. Um, uh, the um, oh, Andrew Yang, um, the men come, the minimum income thing, that's a Keynesian economics idea, basically. Um, it, but generally it's fallen out of favor with, with proper economists. Gover like I say, governments like it because governments um, get to um, you know, it's something that they can control, they can do. They can get the uh, applaud from the audience for doing it, where if it just looks like business is doing it, they don't get the applause from the audience or their voters or whatever you want to call it. So they like government people, right and left, like Keynesian economics. And Keynesian economics is not Marxist socialism. It is different. I want to say that. Some people will often confuse it, but yeah. So, um, like I say, it works. But it has costs. It has lots of costs. And the more you do it, the longer you do it, the greater the costs. And the basic cost is just inflation. But inflation has all kinds of societal costs. Now, one of the major reasons we have inflation today is, is most all currencies have gone away from a standard. And normally the standard was, say, in the U.S. it was like a, a one-ounce gold piece was $20. So every person who has a $20 bill can go in and buy an ounce or go into the government, the Federal Reserve and exchange that paper money for gold. Or there was a time we were on the Silver Reserve, but go and exchange it for hard currency, for, for money, you know, physical moneyed currency. And it was at it and it was set at, um, you know, that there was coinage. At a, at a particular rate. So, yes, um, yeah, fiat money, as your as um, Savage um, Snap is saying, or Sa Severus Snape, sorry, wasn't looking that close, Severus Snape. Yes, I've heard of the Harry Potter, Severus Snape. Yes, fiat currencies. So we are mostly in the age of fiat currencies. Now, there was a time, I mean, be, before paper money even becomes a common thing in, in Europe, it's all coinage. And 
Now, you can look back at different times of coming in with debased currencies, including, um, you know, things, currencies made not out of gold, silver, or um, even copper. Um, you know, they were making it out of other things for pennies and whatnot. Um, there, the, the one time that I'm particularly thinking of is particularly Spain's discovery of the New World. Because they start bringing in so much gold and silver, the Habsburg Empire, now so we see it as Spain because it was mostly from the Spanish part of the Habsburg Empire, but it was bringing in so much gold and silver, there is massive amounts of inflation in Europe. Just because, say, and now the the... the looking a little bit more with the Portuguese at the exact same time as doing the transportation revolution economies that are instead of somebody over here selling to somebody over here to selling to somebody over here, 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 the Silk Road, as you, you probably get what I'm explaining, is selling stuff as it's moving either from India or China you know, selling it from one to another to another to another that each is making a percentage on the thing. So by the time the goods, spices, whatever, silk, whatever, are showing up in Europe, the cost has gone up because of the um, transportation costs, the reselling costs, all that has gone up. So these goods are really expensive in Europe. Well, Portugal is sending ships over and coming back much more easy and directly. So... um. You know what say an ounce of gold would have bought before now there's so much gold and silver on the market you need three ounces four ounces of gold to buy the same thing so that was a massive this is a time of just you know time frame the spanish armada going on um conquest of the new world and it's over time and this is what really funds um, a lot of the habsburg armies is because they do have to pay for it in um, hard currency than they can afford to, but they have this, not unlimited, but this sort of spigot, this flow of gold and silver just flowing into Europe that is has never really been seen before at, that, at such levels. And so this is the cost of Keynesian economics. Now, getting back, what's going on here? Um, and why I'm fundamentally this, yes, this is a special, fundamentally changing Black Ice if you're playing it as part of. And I don't think I've really done this before because I've always sort of respected Black Ice and only changed the things directly that I felt needed to be changed for my mod. But I'm taking this whole, the way they're doing everything, um as being disruptive to black ice i mean disruptive black ice is doing is disruptive to third reich events so i'm i'm changing it i'm removing the the effects of it it's still sort of there but you're not seeing it so you can spend domestically and then once you can physically control whether it's like de facto control say the belgian congo because it has we can um come down here and it has some um you know uranium reserves and whatnot well once belgium is occupied by germany and britain and the u.s are in the war if they seriously need something for the war effort then you know they're get they're getting paid you know into bank accounts if you will or being um paid by giving them tanks and aircraft for the Belgian army in exile or whatever it is, or paying the Belgian army in exile, um, you know, paying for its army or paying for the, the, you know, the civilians that are in exile, that the allies have direct access to this uranium there. And we can look and see here for trade purposes. This is what, so that the whole trading system, that, that they set up and did is gone now in this version. TRE's Black Ice. Third Reich Events is Black Ice is what I'm sort of now calling this. That's gone. So the whole trade that they're doing in Black Ice um, 
when am I going to do a proper playthrough? Once I've done with enough testing, then we're going to do a proper playthrough. This is a special episode I'm recording now. We will continue with the testing soon. So this, these rare materials here, which also represents, I think, things like quinine and other other things. But also we have the quinine here, whether it's the um, no jungle, whatever. Is this, this is the rubber. Um, there's um, jungle medicine. No, this is, oh yeah, this is the quinine. Um, uh, chin... Chona is another sort of term for it. But um, there are several different, maybe rare materials these rare materials over here represent. But I'm looking at, for standard trade purposes, that's these rare materials. But the spigot, the, the limitation on the U.S. need for uranium, or getting uranium, is removed only once you're in close enough alignment, whether it's direct, whether it's U.S., German, or whoever's, ownership, you know, of that province, occupation, whatever, whether it's, um, you know, uh, national territory or occupied territory, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of the game. Once you're either in direct that or you are in close enough alliance, you know, you're in the Axis, you're in the Allies, you're in the common turn, then you, and this is what I agree, then you have greater access to the bent to these special benefits the special benefits and, we're, and i think we've gotten rid of the crash are still here in the game there's just no trading of them they're still here now so they've been moved to this effect instead of necessarily up here because that's why these just have hundred percents up here because you're just whether you're getting all of it and there are some still money in national unity now this is military academy so this is a little different they've left a few of them up here and and national momentum and air major air build speed or whatever but the the ones that are tradable in standard black ice are no longer tradable they're still down here for the strategic effect of them instead of up there they're still in the game but you can no longer trade them because there's no read there's no need to trade them if you're within the same alliance because you're all focused the benefits are special for the war not for trade economies so they're still here don't worry about that but the trading is gone because it's already represented like i'm saying for at least most of the cases in either oil or or rare materials it's already part of part of it there now and so germany Okay, this is one thing that you have to understand. And up until basically more or less the end of the war, German tank manufacturers were, were um, and I just know this because I know tanks better than I know aircraft, but I presume it's going for every major fact, every major thing, are still bidding for government contracts. They are still going, hey, this is the Henschel factory. We want to make the Tiger II. We want to sell these to the government. And they're still trying to, you know, there's still competition. That's why I sort of picked out Henschel, because there's also Porsche. We want to make these these things. And so, and I don't yet know all the details. Now, I do believe there was licensed production, meaning the Porsche factory may be making Henschel model vehicles. But I'm not entirely sure of all of that. And there's still a lot more non-fascist type economics going on in Germany and bidding over contracts. And now the government, so the government is having to pay for all of these Tiger tanks that they're being billed for. And the man hours, they still have a moneyed cost to the German government. Now, whether they were turning over money, physical money, or money into the bank account, I don't know. Or whether they just simply, yeah, bill us, we'll pay you later, meaning, um, you know, a, a promissory note to pay at some point. I don't know exactly in detail how they were handling those. I am very knowledgeable on World War II, but still have a lot to learn. I don't know everything. So I'm not a know-it-all. I know a lot, quite honestly, as you probably know if you've watched enough, but I don't know at all. But they were still paying. Uh, now, of course, you also had slave industries. Now, sometimes, say, um, Henschel or whoever were using slave labor, but there are also quasi-government and direct government 
and party sometimes. Now the party and the government become more and more indistinguishable at times. Ownership of, of things. So it is not just one X type of economy. It's a mixed economy going on in Germany. But you're still having to pay for things. But that bill is going to come due some time. Okay. But for the purposes of this game... With any of these countries, it is unlimited internally. It is unlimited. So you can do this. And to, to mention, um, so, but after the war, you have to pay for this stuff. Whether it's like what I talked about earlier, the war bonds, you got to pay, you got to return the money to the, to the holder of the bond and return interest. So it's more than you, you took out. So you've got to pay that back. And other um, various loans and deficit spendings coming to the thing. And this is what I want to come to. The last Democrat that I know um, who is for lower taxes, John F. Kennedy. One Democrat that almost all the Democrats praise, but none of the Democrats would follow his policies today. Um, okay, so... In 1963, in 1963, we are still working under a war economy put into place because of World War II and the Great Depression, admittedly, for the U.S. So the current tax range in the United States in 1963 is between 20 and 90 percent. And so if you're, only, you know, if you're not making very much money, you're paying 20% on the money. If you're making like a million dollars, I don't know what exact, again, all the exact rates, but you say you're making a million dollars a year, but probably it's more like a hundred thousand dollars a year at the last $30,000 of that or whatever, you're paying 90% of it and it's graduated. So it's like the first $20,000, you're paying at 20%. And then the next, uh, you know, but if you're making $40,000, the next 20,000, you're paying at 40%. So that's 20, 20 of your um, percent, $20,000, you're paying at 20%. And 20 of your $1,000, you're paying at 40%. It's complicated. It's a graduated income tax kind of thing, up to 90%. Well, he wants to reduce it down to 14 to 65 um percent as a maximum now it gets down to um it's not um until after his death in 64 is it lowered to um 70 percent so they don't even get down to um his 65 and the top corporate rate was set at 48 percent and so um and because it, it was at 52 percent for the corporate rate so he was the last Democrat to want to reduce taxes. And the reason they had all of that are, is to pull the money out of the economy. Because they're all still working under Keynesian economics. So the governments can spend all that they want to. It's that they want to pull it out of the economy. Now, um, I think um, Laffer is right in his Laffer curve that... If we, to get the most money for the government, if you want, and we need to get more money for the government, more money for the government, which most of the paradox games don't necessarily, I haven't played them all, don't know them all, don't do this well, because they're Keynesian economics games, um, because you're always looking at from the government. For the government to get the most money out of taxes, the tax rate should be approximately 15%, max. They'll get more money than if they charge you at 90%. Because the economy will grow and will be so, the more, if you're only getting like, it's right actually somewhere like between 13 and 15% is what I think he figures, that the government will get the most money. If you go higher, it actually starts lowering the money. And so if you go up to 90%, you get a lot less. At 90% tax rate, you'll get a lot less money than at 15% tax rate. If they put these in the games to teach people this, um, we would change um, the way people thought about about. Thanks. And I believe that that is the case. 15% is approximately the best tax rate because that, um, yes, flat tax would be best. And you can still have, if you make, you know, if you're truly destitute, truly poor, you know, a, a rebate kind of thing or, um, or no tax under 
whatever the 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 pop whatever your country's poverty line is i don't want to put out a number because it can vary from place to place and time to time whatnot but people below the poverty line and their income wouldn't pay that now of course the other thing would be is to move it to a sales tax that's a whole different um and a sales tax only not like they have in, in england a national vat tax as well as an income tax those um are having both is counterproductive it's one thing to have a, a small slight and it's going up more and more here in california depending on the city but um a small slight sales tax for local taxes if if and only if that same local economy doesn't have an income tax so if your city's your city does not have an income tax but it has a small sales tax and again it sort of works you want to keep it low to keep the because what happens is um take an example here in the greater la the city of long beach used to be a major um area for automobile ship um you know dealerships selling lots of automobiles in the city of long beach one of the ma it was a destination place to come to buy your car well they've raised city sales tax so much every single one of those automobile dealerships which are a big taxable item every single one of them eventually went out of business or moved there's um they either moved to a city just outside of um long beach or they moved to a city that is entirely surrounded by long beach which is called signal hill and so there's automobile dealerships in signal hill and in like torrance right you, i know most of it this doesn't matter but right next to long beach because long beach over different city councils kept raising slowly it was it was the boiling water thing it wasn't like a big spike so it took years for them to move out because i you know look at the stuff but they drove away out of long beach all high ticket sales items and a lot of big box type stores that are in places like that signal hill i talked about or nearby cities so if you're doing lots of retail business and at high end, high dollar retail business you no longer do it in long beach so they drove out by their high sales tax they drove out business so it reduced the city's income you don't if you raise your taxes it actually means at, after a point it means lowered income this is what people don't get about economies so up until 1964 the u.s was still operating in a post depression post world war ii economic footing so the bill the there is a cost to keynesianism to government spendingism to priming the pump it is a severe a significant cost and it will cost lives it's not just oh money it will cost lives because um unemployment means higher suicide rates means higher um addiction rates um you know yeah addiction rates aren't just based on unemployment because trust me i known many people who were um highly employed on lots of drugs you know here in la I used to work in nightclubs they had money they but they had lots they you know so it's not it's not unemployment it's not you know it's not bad life you know or depression in um their life or bad situations that drives them to alcohol drugs and other things it's they do it themselves but it does encourage that thing so there are physical costs to health welfare and overall society unemployment because you're no longer having because if you have a, a situation where you have lots of government employment either directly being a soldier or indirectly making something for the government okay and that's what your economy is based upon but you then remove that the government's no longer buying unlimited amounts of tanks the government's no longer having a mass army but the government is still spending and taxing like they did that means you're going to have more unemployment so um yeah there are costs to keynesian economics and not just quote-unquote economical costs 
there are severe costs to Keynesian economics, and it needs to be um, understood. So yes, again, if leftists understood economics, they wouldn't be leftists. Huh. Okay, so this is why I am removing, and if I find more, and this is some of the playtests we will go on to, and if you want to report more um, of m things that use money for like paying soldiers, paying for stuff internally or whatever, we I have removed from Third Reich events, Black Ice. And that is why. And this is going to be the end of this episode. The live stream is going to continue, of course, everybody watching. But we're ending this episode. So if you haven't already, please like. Um, please subscribe. You can share this on another platform if you want to give people out with an economic lesson. And there. Um, please comment your thoughts. You want to defend Keynesianism. You want to defend the um, Black Ice system. I do want to hear from you. Um, I, unlike other people, I want to hear from people that disagree with me. I may not change my mind, but I do take it into consideration because well thought out points do get considered. Um, but they, you know, they just go into the, they, they may, they may get me to do nothing different from what I'm doing, but I still at least understand the arguments and it's in the back of my mind. So please comment. Thanks so much. See you next time for more Hearts of Iron.